Five panellists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you. Welcome to The Advocate on PLUS TV Africa. Never let it be said that we are not about nailing down practical solutions. I kick off the discussions by recommending we bake a bigger pie. Simple, really. Ekene is staring us up to be battle ready, whereas some might be puzzled as to what battle she is conditioning us for in the first place. Liberus, satirical and topical as usual, faces the contract bazaar and brings to mind the saying, it takes a spoonful of sugar to help the medicine go down. Rookie, tired of beating around the bush, calls it like it is. A system rigged against women. What system, you ask? Our political system, of course. Chuka nails it succinctly. He's talking the ritual of life. Sounds mystical. Get ready for another practical session that takes on the big conversations right here after the break. Some might say Oliver Twist had the right idea. I say, why suffer in silence? My advocacy today is called, the pie is too small, so bake a bigger one. Let's carry out a little thought experiment. If you can picture in your mind the total amount of money that has been illegally siphoned from Nigeria's government from independence in 1960 to date, and then compare that to the, uh, the total amount of Nigeria's total infrastructure deficit, that is, the monetary value of the schools, roads, hospitals, railways, uh, water systems, ports, research institutes, power stations, dams, and all the other things that it would take for Nigeria to provide an acceptable standard of living to its 180 million people. In your mind, think of which of these two figures is bigger. Now, if you believe that the stolen funds are greater, raise your left index finger. If you believe the infrastructure deficit is greater, raise your right index finger. Now let's look at the facts. According to a Chatham House report published in 2019, the total estimated value of illegal financial outflows from Nigeria since independence stands at a staggering 582 billion US dollars. That is a lot of money. According to the African Development Bank, however, Nigeria's current infrastructure deficit stands at roughly $100 billion annually, which means that if not quickly addressed, Nigeria could have an infrastructure deficit of $3 trillion by 2044. So if you put up your left index finger, you are woefully mistaken. That little experiment is one way of capturing the basic misconception at the heart of how successive Nigerian governments formulate economic policy and why Nigerian voters consistently make the electoral decisions that they do. In two of my previous appearances on this show, I have spoken about Nigeria's economic the Wakanda complex and its preference for leaders whose skill is fighting enemies instead of nation building. Both of these issues boil down to the basic assumption that the existing oil revenue pie is or can be enough to sustain 180 million people. So instead of trying to grow our objectively small economy and making it big enough for everyone to participate satisfactorily, we thus end up fighting an eternal losing battle for our share of this tiny and shrinking crude oil revenue pie. At election time, instead of voting for candidates who have plans to grow the economy by encouraging innovation and enhanced private participation, which leads to broad-based accumulation of wealth, we instead vote for demagogues who promise that they will fight corruption, as though Nigeria's $20 billion annual government budget can even make a dent in Nigeria's economic problem. For reference, Egypt's 2020 budget stands at $106.2 billion for its 98 million people, which averages out at about $1,000 per Egyptian per year. 
Our equivalent figure is $111.11 per Nigerian per year. Now, for the sake of argument, let's say you could magically push a button to end corruption. And at the same time, oil prices could go up to $150 per barrel. And Nigeria could maintain peak production with zero leakages for one year. So that's 3.2 million uh, barrels per day. If you prorate that over a year, Nigeria would make about $175 billion. Now, you remove 50% for the NNPC's joint venture partner, and that leaves us with about $87.6 billion for 118 million people. And that comes to about $486 per Nigerian per year, which is still less than half of Egypt's per capita budget. Do you see the point? Nigeria is and has always been a miserably poor country. Even at the peak of the oil boom in the 1970s, Nigeria's per capita GDP stood at $556, which is $2,577 in today's money. Our current per capita GDP stands at $2,081, so clearly not much has changed since that time, except the number of people now competing for a share of the same limited pie. Our economic problem is poverty. The economy is too small, and we need more income, which can only come through privately driven production and innovation. The political solution to this economic problem is to amend the constitution to make it investment friendly, and for us to vote for candidates who will grow the economy instead of the state. The solution is not to give our mandate to those whose only stock in trade, is to give us bedtime stories and Nollywood morality tales about corruption. After 60 years of fairy tales, I think it's time for us to grow up. Should I jump in? Because <laughs> I wish, sorry, I can see Libras are not coming, but let me quickly say this. I wish, um, I, I see where you're going, but I wish the um, corruption we speak of had just that uh, in terms of the price tag. But it comes with, it, it actually lowers morale. So it, it affects everything else. Mm -hmm. So if it was just the cost of corruption in terms of something you could quantify in figures, we'll say, fine, you know, I get your point. But corruption actually takes away the incentive for anyone to want to make any useful contribution to the economy. Mm -hmm. So as long as that corruption is still running its course, nobody is like putting water in a bucket with holes. Nobody will want to make any meaningful investment. So we actually need to still stay on the corruption thing. The, but like uh, someone said on the last advocacy, you can walk and chew gum. So you can actually deal with corruption and you can deal with the money issue, and you can deal with the investments you spoke of, which is the private sector innovation. Mm. But to say you will leave corruption to one side, it's not going to happen because nobody will want to make any useful. Corruption is what creates what they call a disenabling environment. Mm. To, to create an enabling environment that will drive innovation and drive, drive that kind of creativity, Nigerians are very creative people. You have to plug those leaks, and that's the corruption. Quickly, side. before Liberos jumps okay. in, let me just do a 30-second uh, reply to that. And the, the counterpoint to that is that there is nothing special about Nigeria's corruption. Other places have the exact same corruption. But the difference between it. us and them is that they have bigger economies, so they're able to absorb a lot of the impact that we can't. No, so it's a lot more visible in our case because we are poor. No, but you can't um, say they've left no. corruption. Yeah, yeah. They've left then, corruption then, then to run rampant. The but Libras, then they're please. no longer the same mm. because mm. Yeah, why would you... Nigeria is not more corrupt than Russia. Well, I, can, I, 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 would Russia. I would probably say it is because if you know you are that small, why are you that corrupt anyway? Whereas, you know, you, know, you get where I'm going. I in, if I've got five naira and you've got ten, and then I want to be as corrupt as you, I'm, I'm very stupid because I've only got five naira and I will run out of money quicker than you. So I should reduce my corruption, even if to be yeah, proportional. Yeah, yeah. We're not, it's not proportional. So there's something no, I, very I think, wrong. I think um, we're all basically saying the same thing. Mm. But the issue here is. Mm. If you, there are certain things you would do to open up your economy and that will, you know, disincentivize corruption. Exactly. Naturally, all those oh, things yeah. will no longer be attractive. Yes. Because if I know, why wouldn't I want to be corrupt? Because I know that if I work, I will get money. And I can afford all of those things that ordinarily if I steal, I would afford. So if you create opportunities, for businesses to thrive. Why will a man want to just sit down and not work and then make money? And also, it will be unattractive because the people that are watching over some of those businesses will feel, look, I, I work, and then I would not encourage you to sit down and not work. And so, and that's why also, if you, let's, let's take example with um, uh, the banks. There were time in this country where, you know, the old generation banks were just there. And then came the new generation banks. 
And no matter the facade, no matter the abracadabra economics and the voodoo economics that they did, at that time they were able to create jobs. And whilst they were creating jobs, this song about corruption reduced. Naturally, it will die down. And so because that life that the politician can, would live, you see some bankers were even living a better life. Yes. And so it was no longer attractive for people to want to go into politics but to want to work in some of these big companies. You see people wanting to, aspiring to work in telecoms. Mm. Also, some of them wanting to aspire to have, you know, small you service industries mm -hmm. that will now in turn create wealth and, you know, create employment. Okay, okay, let Ruki come in. But in the absence of all of that, of we all look in one direction, government, which is government. government. Ruki. <laughs> Very interesting. Now, I've just been listening to um, the debate. Everyone is really saying the same thing as um, Abra said. The bottom line is corruption is, is still a very big factor in government in Nigeria, and government is still the biggest business in Nigeria. And until we get that business to be disincentivized, remove money from um, serving as a government official, like in the UK, where you have a job, and then you go and do part-time parliament work, I think we're going to still have these issues, where you can issue bogus, bogus contracts, say you are doing high scene cleaning in NDDC or whatever it is. So at the end of the day, the idea that we are corrupt is still a huge problem. The idea that the economy is not working for us is still a huge problem. And we need to still talk about this. No matter what, you can see all the other countries, uh, Russia, uh, Saudi Arabia, they're all corrupt. And we know they are, but like you said, the economies can sustain their own corruption. We can't. Nothing works in Nigeria. And so that is still a topic that we must um, talk about. And so, you know, that's, that's my own submission. We still need to tackle it at that and make sure that people who are elected to work cannot have money. So make the money go away. And they have the real professionals do jobs. You can't have um, people that you um, appoint do forensic audits. I mean, are they accountants? So these, these are just ridiculous ideas that we, like you said, politics is, is um, we're using politics to make us even poorer. Okay, and well, thank you. Thank you, Rookie, for that. Um, that's all we have time for on this segment. So David is saying it's time to grow up, whereas I'm saying it's time to get ready for battle after the break.